heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, chip makers, they warn on the impact of the U.S. curbs on China and the stocks they drop. We'll break down everything you need to know. Plus, we push ahead to earnings as Netflix and Tesla prepare to report results after the bell. And we return to our New York Tech Week conversations. We're going to be discussing the state of fintech and the search for talent here. I think China is the key story, particularly in the context of U.S. technology export curbs to China. I want to first go to Europe. ASML, the Dutch company, a maker of chip uh, uh, making equipment. And basically, short story, they had earnings, not good. But the proportion of what the order they're getting is increasingly from China, ironically. So they've had to come out and address the latest expansion of curbs. In 2023, around 10 to 15 percent of their shipments are going to be impacted by these new restrictions. We're going to talk to our analysts about what is going on here in just a moment's time. The more direct impact as well is on on NVIDIA. Dropping for a second straight day on a two-day basis, we're heading for our biggest two-day drop since December 2022. And they issued an 8K after market. They reiterated what they told us on Bloomberg Technology, Caroline, which is, yeah, no near-term impact to financials. But basically, this is going to impact our ability to service our existing customers and develop new products. That is a concern, particularly for NVIDIA. Let's get more detail and analysis on this and bring in Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence. And Mandeep, what we're talking about here is specifically A800 and H800, China-specific chips being caught by increased curbs. How do you analyze that sort of tangible impact on the industry in 2023? Yeah, look, uh, I mean, we know China revenue is about 20% of NVIDIA's overall revenue, and uh, there is likely some pull forward of that revenue given uh, this wasn't a complete surprise. You know, we're talking about these curbs and ban. Uh, I, I definitely think there was a pull forward element, which is why the company's probably saying there won't be any near term impact. But uh, down the line, you have to ask yourself, you know, about the customer base of NVIDIA's chips. And it's mostly the hyperscalers. Hyperscalers are about 50% of all the buyers of these GPUs right now. And there are two or three big hyperscalers in China. So if they're not able to get their chips for AI training, which is the primary use case here, I think that will have an impact. But near term impact probably is muted because of that pull forward. Aspect. Interesting, muted. We're down by some 10% over the last 30 days. And indeed, more broadly, we saw more than $70 billion shed from the overall well, chip stocks when you're looking at the semiconductor indices. How are you anticipating China US to tug back on some of the valuation run up that we've had? Because it's such a mixed picture for chip makers out there more broadly. We're just talking about ASML and woeful numbers coming from them. Yeah, I mean, in the case of NVIDIA, you had a streak of upward revisions. And to the extent the bogey for 2025 is 80 billion in data center revenue. Now, when you look at, you know, the incremental data center spend right now, every dollar is going towards AI chips and networking. And clearly that will not change. So some of that, uh, you know, chips that NVIDIA can't sell to China will be uh, taken by somebody else. Uh, I, and I have no doubt that the company is undershipping demand right now. But that 80 billion number, it's a very high bogey because the overall data spend, uh, center spend right now is close to 50 to $60 billion when you add all the CapEx amounts. So clearly for NVIDIA to reach that target in 2025, they need demand from everywhere, including mm. China. And I think that's what is at stake here in terms of of what kind of impact it will have two years down the line. Mandy, this is a, a story if there is one. ASML is the company which makes the machines that make the chips and its bookings plunged 42% in the quarter gone because there isn't demand broadly out there. But demand from China doubled. In, in other words, proportion of orders for chip making equipment from China doubled and yet in that same 24-hour period, this company learned about ex- expanded 
export curbs on chip making equipment. How complex is that? Explain it to us. I mean, look at the supply chains right now. So the fabs are all based in Taiwan. The assembly is being done in China. So clearly, you know, it's not a surprise that your latest end equipment is being uh, needed in China because they want to, uh, you know, keep doubling down on their ability to assemble and manufacture a lot of these chips. But at the same time, I feel the big driver for a company like ASML, or for that matter, the semi-cap equipment complex, is the diversification aspect geographically. And every government right now is trying to make sure that they have local fab, uh, semi-fab manufacturing. And they want to get those equipments uh, in, in the region where they, uh, these companies are operating. So long term, I do think the drivers are there for uh, equipment companies, especially EUEs in the case of ASML. But a near-term dynamics, obviously, you can't take China out of the equation given uh, all the manufacturing is being done over there. Fascinating that ASML CEO actually said, our Chinese customers say we are happy to take the machines that others don't want at the moment. It's just a question of how long they can actually be shipping them there. Mandeep Singh, always great to have him on, of course, from Bloomberg Intelligence. And look, this picture is a difficult one. We heard from the CFO of ASML really talking about a very dynamic macro picture coming from China. So let's get into that picture a little bit more with Amy Selico, a partner at Albright Stonebridge Group, which is a part of Denton's Global Advisors. And your expertise is needed here because there are so many many clouds, whether it be geopolitical making, whether it's the U.S. pushing against shipments to China. And then there's, of course, the Chinese economy, which can't really get a clear read on. Start with the economy. How much do you think demand is there for technology from international imports right now? Oh, demand is huge uh, because uh, that international technology is so important for China to continue uh, to push its economic recovery. Good news coming out from China, as you saw with the Q3 numbers beating expectations, 4.9% growth um, in Q3. But it is a slowing economy, and the recovery is far from certain if China doesn't have access uh, to that technology. Clearly, uh, investment is going to continue to be in technology to try to have indigenous technologies replace this uncertainty around access uh, to global technology. But in the very short term, of course, uh, Chinese demand is going to continue to be significant for these uh, technology imports. Uh, Amy, let's head over to China, the Belt and Road Forum. Uh, President Xi kind of made this thinly veiled comment, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, directed at the US, I'm sure, that downplaying basically how much emphasis you should look at the progress and development of others and, and the risk of economic interdependence. I'm assuming that President Xi was talking in the context of technology and technology exports. Are you worried about about this, the sort of posturing on both sides here? Well, certainly, absolutely. For, for all the clients that we serve, it is a significant worry about where are those geopolitical risks going in the, you know, in the wake, of course, of what's happening in Gaza right now. The fact that Russia and uh, China, China's leaders are together in Beijing right now as the president, of course, is in Israel. And then we'll come back to the United States to welcome the leadership of the European Union here and so there are these discussions about how geopolitics are impacting interdependence and i think that is what president xi was getting at in that reference he of course is celebrating 10 year anniversary of the belt and road initiative welcoming foreign leaders from uh, a number of countries representatives from more than 130 countries and so trying to tout the relevance of china on the geopolitical stage at the same time that obviously the U.S. and China disagree on some fundamental issues. And while communicating again, and that's a very positive thing, we're all waiting to see what that communication does. Will it stabilize the relationship or is it only a temporary lull as the relationship continues to get more challenging because of these export controls, because of the U.S. and China disagreeing on issues around Ukraine, around uh, the war that Israel is waging against Hamas right now and other issues around economic interdependence. Something that Xi Jinping is worried about too. But yeah. again, in the short term, he needs uh, that technology input from American companies and others into China. 
I don't think geopolitical risks could be more complex, Amy. And you've put that very clearly to us in that global picture right now. Talk to us about the clients and companies that, I just think of Arm CEO, for example, a company recently listed here in the United States. It's UK based, it's international in terms of its focus. And the CEO, Rene Haas, was at a conference yesterday just saying, look, this is so difficult to be able to just cut off the technology from flowing into the China. And he says it's a very hard problem to solve, just coming up with a list of components that are deemed critical and applying some sort of kind of guidance against it. How difficult is it for your clients? to navigate this right now? It is harder than ever, that's right, Caroline, because companies are trying to gauge where are their truly national security-based restrictions that are impacting them because of policies in Beijing as well as policies here in Washington, D.C. And they have to navigate both of those issues. You're talking about ASML, NVIDIA, other companies that are worried about policy developments that are going to, uh, in some ways, constrain and other ways open up different opportunities for them to continue to grow. And so in Beijing, the policy restrictions are, are we just in the short term able to continue to sell our products until China indigenously innovates its own competition to our products. And so you can't have confidence in the long-term outlook for continued growth in the China market. And then, of course, in Washington, the impact of yesterday's announcements, how will that impact these companies' abilities to continue to gain global profits that they put into global innovation that are derived out of the China market? And so, yes, companies are trying to balance these issues of significant national security concerns that are coming not just out of one country, out of multiple capitals. I'm mentioning Beijing and, of course, Washington, but we're hearing these same concerns coming out of Brussels, Tokyo, elsewhere. And so companies just have to balance um, these issues and try to advocate for the need to continue to promote sales that aren't impacting national security in global markets so that they continue to innovate and remain global leaders like NVIDIA, ASML, others really are. Uh, Amy, let's end on the data. You know, it's a critical consumer electronics market. There are hyperscalers there. GDP came in 4.9%, just below Beijing's 5% target. Give us your Chinese economy scorecard based on that data. Well, China is, uh, I think, in some ways relieved that they're seeing consumption resuming on the ground in China. Now, this is short term and nobody is is, is finished being worried, uh, least of all Chinese policymakers, who are going to continue with stimulus in order to get this economy restarted again, meet this around 5% uh, growth target for this year, looking at next year being even more challenging. But maybe we're looking at December. December, Ed, for what the Chinese government says about continued stimulus in 2024. But just a reminder, putting more investment into the economy just adds that adds to that debt to GDP ratio. And so it is not a long term solution. Chinese economists are saying that so are international economists, that China really needs to empower its consumers to continue to spend by investing in programs that will help consumers be less worried about that outlook for the Chinese economy. That's going to be a difficult Mm. equation for China to manage. Amy Selico, Principal with Denton's Global Advisors. Thank you. Of course, Denton's uh, an Albright Stonebridge Group uh, property. Thank you very much. Coming up, we're going to have the latest now on the Israel-Hamas war and the deadly blast of a hospital in Gaza City last night. Caroline. Such complexity, such concerns. And meanwhile, here in the United States, there is a second vote upon us for Republican Jim Jordan, who is looking to be the next speaker. We'll keep you up to date with how that second vote does indeed go. It's underway. This is Bloomberg Technology. deeply saddened and outraged by the uh, explosion at the hospital in Gaza yesterday. And based on what I've seen, it appears as though it was done by the other team, not, not you. 
but there's a lot of people out there not sure. So we got a lot. We got to overcome a lot of things. U.S. President Joe Biden there expressing his outrage at the explosion of a Gaza City hospital on Tuesday night that killed hundreds. Now, he was speaking during a bilateral meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Tel Aviv. We want to bring in now Joe Matthew of just how difficult diplomacy always is. And it's just got an awful lot tougher. Can you just bring us up to speed with where we are with his trip at the moment to the Middle East? Well, you just framed it perfectly. This is an incredible test for President Biden, and it just got a lot harder in the last 24 hours. The news of this blast, he's really uh, taking a, a decided posture on this to say that data from the U.S. Defense Department shows that this, in fact, was not the responsibility uh, of Israel, but was a missile sent from a terror group in Gaza. He said that in a couple of different occasions today, but let's remind ourselves this was supposed to be a multi-day trip throughout the region. Region. And following that blast at the hospital, a summit of Arab leaders was canceled in Jordan. The president's going to be heading back to Washington tonight. So the stakes here are very high for Joe Biden. The stakes are, it was also announced $100 million in aid to both Gaza and the West Bank. Just tell us how ultimately we're able to see aid flow at the moment when we're looking at a house that's yeah. going through a second vote to try and find a speaker. Well, it can't, is the fact, and that's why there's a great sense of urgency behind this vote. It just started a short time ago. Jim Jordan, again, is up for a second round and is not expected to win this round, and there are questions about what happens after that. The White House is putting together a massive supplemental budget request, $100 billion for not only Israel, but also Ukraine, Taiwan, and border security to try to give lawmakers no opportunity to vote no, because one of these things will be, of course, if not more of them, uh, an important element to any Democrat or Republican, but there's got to be a speaker. And at this point right now, it's unclear who will hold the gavel and when. And I'll remind you, one month from today is when the government is set to shut down. That also cannot be managed unless the speaker fight is resolved. Joe Matthew, we thank you so much of Bloomberg. for work shifting. Look, it's where we take a look at the changing landscape of the labour market amid advances in technology. First up, regulators in the European Union are mulling over stricter rules to monitor generative AI. It's a proposal seen by Bloomberg outlined a three-tiered approach classifying AI models and systems and the rules that would apply. Now, the EU is poised to become the first Western government to place mandatory rules on artificial intelligence. Meanwhile, AI startup Inflection AI wants to limit the role of chatbots in voting in elections. Pi, it's the company's chatbot won't be allowed to advocate for any political candidate. The company is hoping other firms will make their chatbots do the same. Plus, get this, a whopping $17.9 billion has been poured into AI startups so far this year. And that's according to PitchBook data, compiled for Bloomberg. The value of funding for AI companies climbed 27% globally compared to 31% dip in overall deals for startups. Ed. All right, this is a newsletter that the world pays attention to. Celebrity venture capitalist Mark Andreessen is issuing a new manifesto to highlight how technology can advance humanity's achievements and flaws. In a blog post that he published earlier this week, Andreessen says, quote, the only perpetual source of growth is technology. Give us a real world problem and we can invent technology that will solve it. Uh, let's go deep on this and bring in Bloomberg News VC reporter Katie Ruth. What I just said, it's just true. When Andreessen puts out one of these blog posts, it's shared endlessly on social media platforms and debated. Just outline Andreessen's argument in this latest academic exercise. Sure, yeah, you're right. He's definitely good at getting attention, and he's done this several times over the years. He's done one that was called Software is Eating the World. He did one It's called It's Time to Build, and now he's done this one. And, you know, it's always a super bullish case for technology, which makes sense. He is a technology investor, and it is his job to see the future and, and, and make these bets. Um, he always includes some zingers and some very controversial statements in there, which I think, of course, help it get more attention. I think at the end of the day, what you should look at this as is marketing. He's trying to get attention for his firm, Andreessen Horowitz, and you know get an edge on, on some of these startup deals that he's trying to get access to. 
It's also though a pushback against regulation, right? He's trying to speak to policymakers with 5,200 words where he says a deceleration in AI will cost lives. Do you think it will in any way stoke policymakers to, to pull back on the regulatory endeavors? Well, he's cer certainly a leading voice in the venture capital industry. And so if they're interested in hearing from the industry, he's probably one of the people they'll talk to. But I'm sure they would talk to an array of perspectives. I mean, he's always taken a more libertarian point of view. Not everyone in the tech industry has the same uh, political philosophies as he does. But um, he's, you know, he's on the board of Facebook. He's always been kind of vocal about being anti anti-regulation, anti-anyone interfering with anything that the technologists the want to do. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, you know, this is just uh, par for the course for Mark Andreessen. Katie Roof, great to have such VC expertise in the house today. We thank her. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And right here in the Big Apple, well, all week long, we're covering the technology industry because it's tech week upon us. I'm pleased to say we're now joined by one of the key founders in the area who chooses to live and operate her fintech business here in the city. Joining us is Stephanie Kirkpatrick, Aurum CEO, which is all about making payments that much swifter, faster. It's basically building upon Fed now. Before we get into what you're building, why build it here in New York? It feels like fintech is an obvious choice when you think about the financial institutions here. I mean, I had a huge opportunity to pick up and move to New York a number of years ago to chase my passion about the intersection of financial services and tech. And here we are. As I set out to found Orem, there's no better place in the world to recruit diverse talent and to live in an ecosystem where there's grit and tenacity and frankly opportunity, in particular in fintech with what we're building. And I admit every time I see that New York skyline, I think, <laughs> Wow. Okay, Lucky so me. talk about the opportunity in terms of who wants your products and what sort of products they want to be. Because you've been at plenty of other startups. I mean, I think of Lenvest. That was a great exit sold to another financial institution. What did you see that needed to be fixed and why was New York the place to do it? Well, there's a really unique insight. So let me tell you what Orem does and then let me tell you about the problem. Mm -hmm. We are the simplest API for fast, reliable payments and now instant bank account verification which we actually just launched right before Tech Week, so it's exciting times. And when I was inside of big financial services, I saw this huge problem, which is time to money. More than half of Americans don't have enough money in the case of emergency, and if they do, and it's a high-yield savings account or it's a brokerage account, on a Saturday, when they have the emergency, they can't get access to it. I thought that was what crypto was for. Well, <laughs> it turns out the most recent innovation is actually the ATM, which isn't good enough. So with the advent of instant payments, we think that it's important to rebuild the infrastructure that all of our financial services and banking products sit on top of. And so now you've got this new rail, which has been put forward by the Federal Reserve. How does this compare? How does a financial technological ecosystem here in the U.S. compare to abroad at the moment? Well, you know, we are behind, let's say, relative to Europe and other areas where instant payments has been sort of the norm or has recently been introduced, but we're catching up. What I love about what the Fed has done with Fed Now and the instant payments product and what we've had now for a couple of years with RTP, real-time payments, is the beginnings of an opportunity for consumers and businesses alike to see the advantages of something happening instantly, right? In our everyday lives, most things are faster and instant. In our financial lives, everything is slow. Five days a week, maybe if it comes in before the cutoff on Friday, the transaction can happen. That's just no longer possible to sustain. And so now with Fed Now, you not only get the large, you know, top two, three, four hundred banks through the Fed's new instant payments product, you also get all of the coverage for smaller, critically important, systemically important banks, as well as community-focused banks. So now we're getting distribution of instant payments, and the dynamic has changed around what you can do for the American wallet when an insurance claim wages any sort of financial transaction can happen 24-7, 365, nights, holidays, weekends, as opposed to nine to five banking hours. And I just think about that crux point that we saw back on March 13th when we were concerned about the Silicon Valley Bank and the rush to try and get payments through then and there. To, to that point, I mean, what a tumultuous 2023 it actually has been. I mean, I can't believe it's only about six months since that debacle in the banking area. For you, because you're launching these new products, because you're seeing this sort of level of innovation, 
Do you have VCs knocking? Do you have the new VCs that are putting boots on the ground here in New York City knocking? Well, let me start by saying our first investors were boots on the ground in New York before it was popular to be in mm -hmm. New York City. So I'm obviously steadfast about believing in the ecosystem here. And yeah, there are people knocking at the door, I think because the importance of the problem and the job to be done is huge. That said, I think fundraising is a very specific thing. And it shouldn't be just done casually. And what I love about the current environment is there's time now built in. Unlike 2020, 2021, where you're deciding in a weekend, <laughs> between you and your investors, you can make a decision about what this is going to look like because you are signing up for a very long-term, lifelong relationship with people that are going to sit on your board. And we've endeavored to have our board be at least 50% female. We've endeavored to have our rounds focused on having representation for female and underrepresented investors. And so I can't rush that process. Despite interest in the current environment, I think it's really important to establish incredibly good relationships mm. so that when you say, let's handshake and put capital into a business that's growing, you know that you're doing it in a way that's designed to fuel the next chapter and not just because that's what the environment is promoting today. Okay, interesting. So you've got a real focus on a diverse board. I'm sure you're therefore also got a real focus on diverse talent. Is the talent from a tech perspective more diverse here in New York? Or do you look to hire in New York? Do you look to just be sort of agnostic as to where your people sit? Well, Orem is actually a COVID baby, which means during all of our growth and you know fundraising, we were doing that during pandemic time. So we do have the advantage of having both a footprint here in New York and the opportunity to think about our core value of diversity of thought through diversity of people broadly across the US. I think the diversity of talent here is exceptional because people come to New York for some of the world-class engineering programs and design programs that are based right here in Manhattan. And as a result of that, you have not only talent that's rolled out of other successful, well-built mm -hmm. um, companies that want to go back into earlier stage companies, you also have an influx of folks with engineering talent coming out of the education system. And because New York is already such a diverse place, that naturally creates a population of opportunity. Um, but we wouldn't, I think we would be remiss in not looking broadly um, where we can find the most diverse talent to build, frankly, the best team. And that doesn't always have to be from Stanford or Harvard. Um, it, it, diversity and obviously t incredible talent comes from everywhere. Well said. Stephanie, it's great to have you here in the building. She's got a whole load of other events to run off to. We thank her for it. Stephanie Kirkpatrick of Orem. Great to get some fintech perspective there and talent perspective. And we want to dig into that angle a little bit more now because Svenja Goodell is with us, chief economist at Indeed's Hiring Lab, leading hiring platform. And I, I want to really get your assessment of what the talent pool looks like here in New York in particular. How big an ecosystem, a bigger pool of tech jobs is it compared to the other industries? You know, overall, uh, I think New York is unique in that it has a larger share of tech jobs than we're seeing uh, for the nation as a whole, roughly double. Um, but keep in mind, tech jobs still make up a relatively small percentage of overall jobs. In New York, roughly 5% of all jobs. Svenja, AI has had a pretty dramatic impact on cities around the world, frankly, you know, from a sort of wealth creation standpoint, job creation standpoint, Caroline and I sit there and look at some of the job postings and the salaries on offer here in the Bay Area, as an example. Do you see that happening in New York as well, where there is a fight for talent and, and they're paying over the nose for it? Um, Yes and no. Um, you know, as a good economist, I'll tell you the one end on the other hand. Um, I think t t taking a step back and looking at tech as a, you know, as a category as a whole, um, there we, particularly in New York, saw this extreme boom bust development happening, right? So we saw during the pandemic, a lot of tech companies hiring fiercely and demand for, for uh, tech jobs was very high. We saw that in our Indeed job postings. And uh, right around, you know, early 2022, we saw that demand really start to scale back and now tech jump uh, tech companies have right scaled we've seen a lot of action on that front a lot of headlines where tech companies uh, are going through layoffs and that particularly hits uh, you know software developers uh, engineers out there and um, with that we've seen actually job postings uh, particularly in the New York metro area uh, really take a step back demand has really come down quite a bit and now we're we're back to um, 
below pre-pandemic levels. We're actually 30% below uh, in terms of uh, job postings in the in the New York metro area to where we were early in, tw- in 2020. So we've taken a distinct tech, uh, step back on, on tech in New York. However, and this is a big however, uh, you know, and what you're talking about in terms of Gen AI jobs, they're really booming. What we've seen there, and we've just came out with, with a bunch of research, we have a Gen AI tracker that we published, uh, and we look at uh, jobs that uh, you know, really demand Gen AI skills. So think about machine learning engineers, data scientists that can work with these algorithms for large language models and so forth. And there you see, off of a very small base, tremendous growth that you're really t- starting to see. There's a lot of demand there. And yes, you're absolutely right. Those jobs are getting paid very well. And there's a small pool of people that have these skills to be able to work with these models. And they're in very high demand right now. Svenja, our last guest brought the, the fintech perspective, and that, that's a, an industry that we do associate with New York, given the sort of legacy finance industry of there. But in which corner of the technology sector is the highest concentration of, of New York or East Coast jobs? You know, we're seeing, particularly in New York, we're seeing a uh, high concentration just overall in software development and full stack engineers. Um, and we're starting to see that pick up in, uh, in, in Gen AI type, type jobs. And of course, New York has a lot of the fintech in there uh, in as well, given that it's New York. Uh, so we, we do see that concentration uh, there. But it's worth noting that remote work has really played a role here as well, because we have seen some dilution on, on that front, right? Because now companies, particularly that are, are you know, have multiple, uh, you know, bases around the country, are able to uh, diversify their workforce and also hire people in other locations uh, and have them work from home and have their nearest office be relatively close mm-hmm. and dial into important things that are happening in New York. So particularly on the tech front, we see that the share of remote jobs is very high and that has that dilution effect uh, happening with that as well. Svenja, I know you have an economist hat. But I'm interested in your regulatory take, if you're read in on the idea that New York has in many ways sort of tried to lead the charge on regulating around the use of AI in hiring Mm -hmm. and ensuring that there isn't bias built into the system. And that was, I think, brought in in April. How is that changing the landscape, do you think, for hiring here in New York? You know, I think it's too early to tell uh, exactly what, uh, you know, how we integrate these these new technologies, these new tools, because they're constantly evolving, how companies are using them is constantly evolving. And uh, I, I do think that it's incredibly important to think about uh, bias and how we use these tools. And, you know, it's we often think about uh, generative AI as this own entity that it's uh, being imposed on us and, and we don't know what to do with it. Mm. The, the good news is that we have all the control here. We're able to figure out uh, how we want to apply it, where we want to apply it, and make sure it's uh, applied in a fair and um, equal way across uh, different industries, across different people, across different jobs. And, you know, from a policy perspective, that's really important. And now is the time to start thinking about these these issues so that we can we can properly, uh, you know, really use these tools to their greatest advantage without causing additional issues. Svenja, really great to get your take and we look into that data that you provided on Gen AI and jobs. We thank you, Svenja Goodell, indeed Chief Economist. Ed, what have we got coming up? Yeah, well, technology jobs has been one of the stories of the year. Another has been Tesla's shares doubling in 2023. We're going to break down what's watching Tesla's upcoming earnings with former board member Steve Wesley from the Wesley Group. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology. To tech earnings land now. We got Netflix reporting today after the market closed. So much to monitor here from the company's push into video games, the writer's strike that's impacted all of Hollywood, of course. And still, look, the co CEO, Ted Sarandos, thinks Netflix has some good days ahead. Just take a listen. We have a ton of room to grow revenue from here. And I'd say that we're pretty um, underpriced based on those kind of st- statistics of 10% of screen time and 5% of revenue. That was, of course, at last week's Bloomberg Screen Time event in L.A., where Ted Sarando sat down with our very own Lucas Shaw. I'm pleased to say, joins us now. And so that room to run, that revenue push, are we going to see it this quarter? 
Well, we'll find out in a, in a few hours, obviously. They have spent much of this year instituting or rolling out two of their big new strategies. That's their advertising tier, which creates a, a lower priced option for some cost sensitive consumers, and their crackdown on password sharing, which amounts to a price increase for a lot of people. You know, one question on, on a lot of investors' minds and, and frankly, a lot of customers' minds is whether Netflix is going to raise prices for its basic tier again. There's been some reporting to suggest they will. The executives have suggested as much as well. That's sort of what Ted Sarandos, I think, was getting at there when he said that the, the company or this, they're, they are underpriced. Whether they'll announce that after earnings today remains to be seen. And Lucas, that puts into perspective the ad supporting tier, right? Because it will inform that decision on, on raising prices. And th- there seems to be a micro focus on Netflix's ability right now to sell commercials and, and feed its ad supported tier. Yeah, well, they, we've just gone through, or I think we're in the middle of advertising week in, in New York. Uh, one of their senior advertising executives, Peter Naylor, who, who came from Snap and was previously at Hulu, spoke and, and unveiled some new features. You know, I think the challenge for them in advertising right now is they just don't have a lot of scale. They've taken a different approach from, from Disney and others. You know, they have made it an opt-in uh, kind of tier, which means that you can choose to sign up for it, but existing customers see no change in their pricing. And Netflix Netflix hasn't been growing fast enough to add a ton of new customers to it, uh, but their approach is, I'd say, more customer or consumer friendly than, than most of their peers. What about the gaming landscape? Because this was an interesting area of focus for investors too. You know, it's, it still feels very early. There was a, a pretty good piece in the Wall Street Journal early, earlier this week looking at the, kind of the state of things with their gaming. Um, they've commissioned a ton of games. They've released a lot of games. Uh, we have yet to hear of any Netflix game that's been a big breakout. They've been very cautious in their language around it. You know, they're talking a lot about this sort of walk, crawl, run language that they like to use. My guess is that we're still a few years away from seeing anything meaningful from them in games. All right, Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw, thank you very much. The other big name after market is Tesla. The stock down 4% in the session, but remember it's up more than 100% year to day. Tesla's margins rapidly eroding, raising doubts about the viability of maintaining its sales growth after the EV maker started waging that price war. I want to bring in Steve Wesley, Wesley Group Managing Partner, but also, of course, a former Tesla board member. Steve, the equation for Tesla has been really simple. They're, they're, they're happy to sacrifice the bottom line, cut prices, impact margins, but maintain 50% annual growth. Growth. The question for investors is how much profit erosion they're willing to take. What do you think the answer is? Well, right now, they're just grabbing market share. So look, this is a slow quarter. They delivered 435,000 vehicles down from a record 466 in Q2, 24.3 billion in revenue, on track 35% year over year growth and $100 billion a year. That's not bad. But expect Tesla to come roaring back in Q4. Most people don't realize they've cut prices 25% in 2023 and they're still profitable. So our margins compressed, yeah, but you can now buy a Model 3 or a Model Y for roughly 32 to 34K after rebates. That's less than the average gas-powered car in America. So Tesla's currently selling 50% of all EVs in America. That's more than everybody else in the market combined. I think they're going to have a record Q4 deliveries, probably close to 550,000. It will be big, at least 1.8, 1.9 million units for the year. But the big question is, can they hold off BYD and the Chinese makers? That's going to be the big smackdown. I, I hear your big question. I raise you one other big question. Is Tesla a car company or is Tesla a technology company? And, and what we're writing about on Bloomberg today is automotive gross margin forecast to fall from around 28%, which is like tech margins, to 19%, more in line with traditional car makers. So here's the answer you may not have expected. Tesla's a car company. It's absolutely a tech company, the leader in selling over the air software, new features like autonomous driving, but they're also an energy company. And it is no, should be no secret or surprise to anyone that the two dominant leaders in the EV vehicle world and every auto company is going electric, make no mistake. The two leaders, Tesla and BYD, are also energy companies. So the big smackdown here, the big battle is, can Tesla hold off BYD? BYD is the clear leader in 
China and South America and Mexico and places where you're selling cars in the fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollar range. Tesla obviously has a big advantage in the thirty thousand dollar and up range, but Tesla has thirteen percent net margins. BYD uh, at four to five percent. Those margins may come down a little bit, but as long as Tesla continues to grow at this rate, thirty-five percent year over year, I think Tesla is going to be in the driver's seat for a little longer than people think. China is such an incredibly important story for so many across tech and EV. Us thanks to Steve Wesley, Wesley Group Managing Partner, and of course, former board member at the EV maker, Car. Talking of the importance of China, Apple CEO Tim Cook won backing from China's commerce minister today, who told Cook that look, China welcomes Apple to benefit from the country's market and engage in, quote, win-win development. Now, this is all according to a statement from the Chinese ministry. It all comes at a time when Apple's sales outlook in the world's number two economy, look, it's been under scrutiny. Meanwhile, as the U.S., of course, is tightening rules on AI chip sales to China, iPhone maker Foxconn and NVIDIA said they would build AI factories together. It's all according to the Financial Times. Foxconn has been trying to diversify its revenue base from manufacturing electronics to building the computing infrastructure empowering autonomous technology. See how we just tied that all in one beautiful bow tie for you, China and the impact on U.S. tech. This is Bloomberg Technology. the social network formerly known as Twitter, has just begun testing a $1 per year subscription fee for new accounts on the web that want to post or interact with other users. Now, the company says the measure, which is called Not a Bot, has the potential to reduce spam, automated bot accounts, and manipulation of its service. Ed, this is all, of course, happening yeah. overseas. New Zealand, one of the test beds, the Philippines as well. And Elon Musk called it, you know, $1 a year to write, but you read for free. Yeah. So, so when X first introduced subscriptions, the idea was that it disincentivizes people that want to be spam or bot account operators, right? Who pays $9 to have an account that, that has the sole purpose of being spam or a bot? They're just doing it at a much lower bar, $1. I don't know if that will work, but now they have a case study. And this is all about monetization. Of course, they got, what, $1.2 billion to pay in interest payments. Bloomberg understands. And India Yaccarino have already been articulating there might be a three-tier subscription level that we're going to see. Yeah, squeezing out dollars. But, you know, how pervasive are bots on the platform? We still don't have a good handle on that. Musk says they're down, but many of us experience them day to day. Well said. That does it from this edition of Bloomberg Technology, though, Ed. Yeah. Recap the podcast and thank you for listening wherever you get your podcasts from New York City and SF. This is Bloomberg Technology.